Sailing relies on the wind. The Olympics rely on dreams. Over 300 competitors from all over the U.S. and several foreign countries gathered in Newport over the Memorial Day weekend to pursue their dreams. The purpose of the pre-trials was twofold. First, to allow the competitors an opportunity to experience the conditions they'll face a year from now during the actual trials. And secondly, to provide a dry run for the Olympic Organizing Committee. The experience was one of rain, fog, huge ocean swells, sun, wind, triumph, and defeat. Such is the road to the gold in Moscow in 1980. Gold in the Wind, brought to you by distributors of Fram and Autolite. A regatta the magnitude of the Olympic pre-trials does not happen in four days or a week. A committee made up of executives from every Rhode Island yacht club headed the project. The Fort Adams Mule Barn was the focus of attention. The barn was built in the 1820s to house the mules which carried the blocks of granite for the construction of the fort. Rhode Island's active sailing groups convinced the state to pour $300,000 into the area. That figure was matched by the federal government. Workmen had to rush to get the barn ready. The weather didn't help. As competitors poured in from all over the country, the rain poured down. This place can be very beautiful, you know, when the weather's nice, but uh, it's kind of rotten. Everything's all wet. You come in, you can't dry out your clothes. You can't dry out yourself. So uh, you just have to do it anyway. Where did you come from? Uh, Newport Beach, California. Oh, so you came all the way out here to... Uh, to get wet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd probably be a little nicer in California right now. Registration gave many an opportunity to renew acquaintance with old friends and chief rivals. At the last minute, the pre-trials committee decided to allow some foreign competition to give U.S. sailors the opportunity to compare themselves to the foreign entrants. Many of the fins were voluntarily weighed and measured to ensure the boats were within the prescribed standards. The minimum weight is 319 pounds. Later, the Finns set sail in the harbor for a clinic with magical Newport looming in the background. Unlike the other five classes entered in the pre-trials, Finns have just one sail and only one crew member. While the Finns were in the harbor, crews of the other five classes were busily preparing their boats for sail. One of the most important factors in racing is preparation. Literally hours are spent fine-tuning, scraping, and sanding. After the sanding or fairing comes the gel coating and re-gel coating. Wet sanding and then a paste is applied. Next, a Teflon speed coat. The boat is then hosed down between each race to take the salt on, and a wetting agent is applied at least 12 hours before the race. We, we arrived with a uh, bare boat and box full of parts. <laughs> and uh, if you notice, um, our competitors are sailing away to the practice race right now. But we, we'll be out there in about 45 minutes. The first day of racing was set for Friday, but overnight the fog rolled in. Morning brought limited visibility and heavy rains. So the first race was canceled. Later in the day, the boats assembled in the bay for a practice race.
The Finn was designed by Ricard Sarbi of Finland in 1950 and was first included in the Olympics in 1952. The Finn appeals to younger sailors because of the physical demand. The boat is light and fast. The 470 is molded in fiberglass and reinforced in plastic. The boat was designed in France for domestic use until it was granted international status by the Yacht Racing Union. The 470 was first sailed in the Olympics in 1976. It's an exciting boat to sail in heavy air because of the small sail area and the light weight. The Flying Dutchman is the fastest two-man centerboard boat in the world. This boat requires maturity, quickness, and sensitivity of its crew. This has been the most difficult class for U.S. sailors to perform consistently at the championship level because it demands continuous exposure to top competition at the international level, something not readily available for U.S. and Canadian sailors because of geography and time. A Norwegian designer conceived of the idea of the Soling while doing tank test research on a new 5.5 okay. meter for the 1960 Olympics. The Soling was first sailed in the Olympics in 1972. It's the perfect combination of hull, rig, keel, and rudder that makes for a fast Soling. This boat is normally skippered by an older, more experienced sailor, while a young crew carries out the tasks. The U.S. has dominated in this class, but in 1976, America was forced to settle for a silver medal. The Tornado Catamaran was the first multi-hole class to race in the Olympics. The Cats first competed in 76. The boats added a new and dramatic dimension in terms of speed and performance. The Tornadoes are light and quick, offering a wild ride, but the secret lies in control at all times. The first Star Family boat was used in 1922, making it one of the oldest classes of boats. It appeals to middle-aged sailors. While other boats seem to differ in varying conditions, the star is pretty much the same. So sailing the boat and strategy are the key factors here. Sailing is an art. Skills are developed with long hours of water time. The wind is never absolutely steady for any length of time in any direction. The trick is to find the wind and then anticipate its change. The principles of sailing are complex, but basically the sails are curved much in the same way an airplane wing is curved. Just as the air rushing over and under the wing causes uplift, air hitting the curve of the sail generates movement. Add another sail forcing air to shoot through the opening between the two, and speed increases. The smaller sail up front is known as the jib. The larger sail is called the mainsail. The spinnaker is a light balloon-like sail used when running or reaching. Positioning and use of these sails determines the speed a boat will travel. This allows the boat to sail into the wind or almost any direction desired. It's really nice here. It's uh, a little foggy, but it's nice wind, and uh, it's very windy because of the bays up in here. And uh, it's colder, so what can you say? Of course, uh, everything won't be as big out here, will it? Uh, yeah, well, that's... <laughs> I don't know, it's pretty big up here. No, this is, this is great sailing up here. It, it really is. Doug Peterson, a health economist, and Brad Alford, a recent Rice grad, brought Hardtack 1,771 miles from Houston, Texas, to take part in the pre-trials. A1 number competition, that's why we came. Well, how popular is sailing down in Texas? It's very popular. It's, uh, how popular is sailing down there? Day, it's it's really hard to find an open spot of water. There's just tons really of boats is. out. It's it's very fun. The two have sailed the big boats, but they prefer the smaller one. Well, like one ton series and and you know the big offshore, but the, um, the small boat sailing you have a, a it's much more compact. You have a lot more action, a much shorter span of time. Usually in the big boats, it's just a long chain once you get going a parade around the buoys. But the small boats, it's a lot of tacking and a lot of uh, upwind work, and then a lot more exciting compared to the bigger boats. The big boats are a little bit a little bit easier and uh, it's it's somewhat different. I, I enjoy both and it's quite a bit different, you know, the, everything that goes on in a little boat and a big boat. I think 
boats, you learn more and you learn quicker in a small boat. So that I think the people that uh, end up on the 12 meters will come from the, the people from here. California sailmaker Lowell North came to Newport to crew a soling. North didn't have the time to mount a challenge himself, so he decided to crew. He skippered Enterprise for most of the America's Cup trials in 1977 before being dumped by the syndicate in the final days of the trials. What about the 1980 America's Cup? Do you expect to mount a challenge again? No. no. Why not? Well, um... To race a 12 meter, you have to be invited for starters, and I haven't been invited to race one. I don't have one, so. Uh, Do you think Enterprise will race again, the, the boat itself? Uh, no, Dennis is not going to race both boats. In other words, one boat will just sit there and not be raised. Uh -huh. Whichever boat he decides is faster, he'll race that one. The other boat will, uh, will be idle. Oh, what's it like to be brother and sister and uh, combine your efforts into sailing? Like in the summertime, I mean, we live in the same house all year and we are at the same place in the summertime. We can go practicing anytime we want to and we don't have to travel to uh, find each other. And that's, that's real good. Plus, we know each other pretty well and that's important in these classes too. We, don't go, we go along pretty good, so we don't uh, fight in the boat too much. No fights. No fights. <laughs> Mary Ann and Kristen Witt are from Norway, but both work for Abbott Sales in Canada. They sail a 470. Relatively few women are competing here, but this doesn't bother Mary Ann. It's not all power. Like, it's a lot of technique and uh, tactics, too. So, actually, girl, it's not as disadvantaged as she would be in other sports. So, really, it's... I have probably... I'm softer than a lot of the guys, too. You, you, girls use me are. So, I don't think we have very much disadvantage sailing girl and a guy together and you can see from the teams that have been sailing there's been some very successful teams. I think it's uh, fine. She's, uh, she's really good to concentrate. She can keep her eyes on the telltales and the wa waves for hours and uh, you know that's that's really good. It's a lot of guys that can't do it. So that you, ca that you can concentrate on the steering is a lot more important than maybe that you can hike uh, a little bit further out if you're a guy. The key thing coming here is is boat speed. I think um, we use there's a certain in the 470 class people have arrived at a certain level where their gear, their the Vanguard boats, the Z Spar, uh, Sobstad, Nolman sails are are an accepted level of excellence, and so it's a very small to difference in degree in boat speed. So we hope to find out that we're going well. If not, then it's, it's hard to find out why not, because we're often using the same gear. 23-year-old Tam Matthews of Toronto is a member of the Canadian national sailing team. Usually in Canada, what was happening, and it happens in the United States a lot too, people get to the age 18 to 22 and they drop out of sailing for financial reasons, for job reasons, for school reasons, whatever. In Canada now, we have a, a program which is organized by the CYA to encourage people uh, to continue and uh, this has given the Canadian team much more depth in all classes now. It started out just in Solings and subsequently all classes have developed to a stronger level. So uh, I think all Canadians are pretty happy right now. You are a long ways away from the ocean in Toronto so you must sail on a Great Lake or on fresh water. What's the difference in coming to uh, the Great Salt Water? <laughs> well I, th I think the biggest difference is just probably the pain factor in the eyes. Um, and the other key factor is just all, all the boat equipment. The salt really eats into the gear. Keith Nottery and David Gambian from Florida sail a tornado catamaran. What, what is it uh, about the cats that, that make this so interesting? Uh, they're so susceptible to wind, and it seems like it would be a, a wild ride out there. It is, but that's the fun of the boat. They're fast, they're exciting to sail. They're the best, really. Keith, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, we go out sailing and have a good time. You know, rather than pound around and stay dry. <laughs> the worst thing is this, the, the pounding of the monohulls, and they roll like this, and the cats don't do that. They perform and stuff like this instead of yeah. fighting it. Okay, so it's more in rhythm with Right, because sea. you got a wide boat, and the boat's not going to, you know, like a monohull, just is like this over a wave. It just rocks and rolls, and you get seasick out there. But these things don't do that kind of emotion. How serious are Brazilians about the sport of sailing? Oh, 
We are trying to be better. We are working very hard in the last two years, trying to become better and better. And we, we hope that we can make uh, good places in the next Pan Am Games and next year at the Olympic Games. Eduardo Ramos is the Brazilian souling champ. Ramos has sailed on the Baltic Sea in Russia where the 1980 Olympic competition will be held. I was there last year oh, you were. for the, for the Tallinn week. And it's no. <laughs> the same weather that we have here today. We had a week like this last year over there. And for this reason, we had only four races. And foggy all the time, raining, colder than here today, and very shifty, windy. Uh, not windy, very shifty, and light winds and changing all the time. What do you feel about this atmosphere, uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and America, and the sailing scene, and everything Super, else? Huh? For us, it's really fantastic to be here and to sail all the already 312 meters here, and all this lot of boats and everybody here trying to have good boats and good speed and thinking only how to sail better and better. After a week of bad weather, racing finally began on Saturday. But lack of winds and then huge ocean swells hampered the sailors. 30 competitors suffered seasickness during the day. The weather settled for Sunday and then the rain returned for Monday's finish. The Finn class was dominated by 22-year-old Carl Bucken, a student at the University of Washington in Seattle. Bucken, a former U.S. youth champion and U.S. national laser champ, is shown with U.S. 1015 on his sail. This was a familiar sight in the Finn competition with Stuart Neff of Oyster Bay, New York, dueling with Bucken in all four races. Neff wound up second in the overall competition. At stake for the Finns were four $1,200 grants from the U.S. Olympic Yachting Committee to help the competitors attend two championships in Europe this summer. Bucken and Neff were awarded the grants, along with Cam Lewis of Sherbourne, Mass., who finished third overall, and John Bertrand of San Rafael, California, who was fourth. The foursome will enter a regatta at Tallinn in the Soviet Union and the Finn Gold Cup Series at Weymouth, England. Two other skippers completed a clean sweep of the class races. Terry McLaughlin of Toronto captured first place in all four races in the Flying Dutchman class. McLaughlin and crewman Every Bastet of Montreal will most likely represent the Canadians at the 80 games. The Canadians have been getting better and better over the last few years and so uh, I think it's uh, through, you know, government backing and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, all classes have been getting better, and especially the Dutchman class, they've always been fairly strong uh, ever since, you know, Hans Vogt sailed Dutchman in North America. Over the past three years, the two have won the U.S. Nationals, the Canadian Nationals, and the North American Championships in the Dutchman class. They also have won the Canadian Olympic Regatta this year. There were a few victims of the heavy seas. Marshall Duane of Florida and Mike Loeb of New Haven had to cling tightly to their capsized Flying Dutchman. Both escaped injury. The other clean sweep was in the Tornado class with Keith Nottery and David Gambian of Florida winning all three races. There were actually four races, but shifting winds and last minute changes in the course left some of the sailors confused about the location of the finish line. So one race was thrown out. Frank Weston of Herndon, Virginia skippered the second place finisher, and Keith Bliss of England was third. As you can imagine, the rough seas greatly affected the tornado class. Four tornadoes were capsized in the competition, including this one, sailed by Larry and Marianne Deering of Bellport, New York. Both were uninjured by the mishap. The 470 class was won by former Yale All-American Steve Benjamin. His crew was Neil Fowler of Tufts. The two men won a pair of races and then finished third and second. Benjamin is from Oyster Bay, New York. He says the skipper and his crew must know what the other is doing at all times. Oh, uh, there's, there's many keys. It's, uh, you might compare it to, to something like a marriage, only it's, it's a pretty complex uh, relationship between skipper and crew, and working out all the bugs between it is, uh, takes a while. Canadians Tam Matthews and Jay Cross finished second overall in the 470 class. Former URI All-American Skip White finished fourth overall. 
Peter Eisler of Roe Wayton, Connecticut, skippered the winning Soling. Eisler and Steve Benjamin were teammates at Yale a few years ago, along with Dave Perry, who sailed with Eisler in these pre-trials. Perry feels the Soling is perhaps the most challenging boat. You don't have to be really super physically big or strong to sail in it. Um, so a lot of the older, more smart guys who are getting a little older and, and not you know, work so hard gravitate to that class. Uh, whereas in the 470 or the Finn, you just got to be really strong and agile and really ready to you know, bust tail. So, so what these guys do is a lot of the best sailors will get good young crews that will go nuts over the edge, drag through the water, and then you get real smart guys driving the boats. And I mean, you get some really smart people out there. I, I respect the sailing class above any other class right now in terms of the amount of depth. Dave Curtis of Marblehead, Mass, skippered the second place sailing. Bill Abbott of Canada was third. The star competition was won by Tom Blackcaller with crew Ed Bennett, both from San Francisco. The pair won three races and finished second in a fourth. I like the one design aspect of the star better than, let's say, the IOR boats or the six meters or boats like that. Uh, I've sailed a lot of IOR boats and a lot of six meters, and different boats perform well in different conditions. If it's light air, one boat wins. If it's heavy air, another boat wins. With the star, the boats are all very, very much the same. The masts are the same. The sails are the same. It makes the sailing of the boat the important factor, not, not the boat itself. So that, to me, is more fun. Tom Blackcaller outdueled Bill Buck and father of Finn winner Carl. Tom and Bill will duel many more times before next year's finals. The Olympic regatta was a success. It gave the competitors an opportunity to experience a variety of conditions and at the same time allowed the Olympic organizing committee a chance to see what went right and what they need to change in time for next year's final races. Now as these sailors prepare in earnest for a return trip to Newport in 1980, the state of Rhode Island has taken another step toward international recognition as the sailing capital of the U.S. and perhaps even the world. The competition, the atmosphere, the facility all add up to gold in the wind in 1980 and for years to come in Newport. Gold in the Wind, brought to you by the distributors of Fram and Autolite.